speaking of observation, you know, we'll just talk about the science of Kriya, right? And what is science? Because people have this image of people in a lab coat and blah, blah, blah. The science is just a means of exploring the world around us, you know? And so, and technically science is the use of the scientific method, right? So what's the scientific method? Hypothesis, experiment, observation, conclusion, right? And we already talked about predictable, repeatable results. I don't believe in believing, don't believe me, just do the practices. Come back and tell me whether I'm full of it or not, right? <laughs> but hypothesis, you know, I practice, Kriya, you know, the hypothesis, Kriya Yoga will create emotional and, and um, you know, personality or life changes, changes in perspective. All right, I'm going to do these practices six times a week for six months, for 30 minutes a day. Okay, that's the experiment. Observation, I take notes. And that's what separates this from speculation. That's what takes this from the realm of mysticism into the realm of science, or, or brings the two together, is the observation and the notes, you know. And then conclusion, at the end of the time, I go back and look at my notes. And the notes are extremely valuable. Because my, it's, you know, everybody wants to have this spiritual epiphany. And they happen, you know. But it's not always that, okay. It's, it's the day-to-day -day process. And it's like I liken it to watching a child grow. You know, every day you see them, you give them their breakfast and send them to school or whatever. And, but you go back and look at a picture of them from three months or six months ago, and wow, they've changed. But you didn't notice that from yesterday to day. And it's the same kind of thing. You're changing. As you're doing these practices, you're changing. But you may not notice it on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, so even just a few brief lines. Here's what I experienced in meditation. But even more important than that, you know, here's what I experienced, or just as important as that, here's what I experienced during the day. Because the patterns that have been ingrained in your being are going to start to shift, right? And so I'm driving down the road and somebody cuts me off and my normal pattern is to, hey, you son of a bitch, or whatever, right? And they, then, then it happens, they cut me off and I st reach your hand up and you go, there's not really a charge behind it. That's a shift, but you didn't even know about that shift until the stimulus was applied, right? And then the reflex action started you down that path, but the energy wasn't there. So there's a note, hey man, I was just cut off in traffic and my response was totally different. Or whatever your patterns are. You know, and it's it's that it's that note, and so there will be epiphanies, and there will be an experience, and like wow, that just shifted my perspective, and those will come more and more quickly as you do these practices, more and more frequently, I should say. <clears throat> but it's really the day to day, like climbing the stairs every day, and then every so often you get to look out a window and go, wow, I'm really I've gotten a lot higher in this building, you know. But it's the climbing the stairs you know, that, that's, that's making that progress. So the notes, the observation, is really, really a valuable part in making this into a spiritual science. And I'm not saying it's not going to work if you don't take notes. You're just not going to have as much of a reference to go back and go, wow, I've changed a lot in six months, you know, without like a stimulation like the guy cutting you off in traffic, you know. So that's, that's what this is all about. Now we talked about relaxation, right? How important relaxation is. But just as important as that, or one of the most important factors, I should say, is your intent. What is your intent? Okay? And I would say the same thing, intent, 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 intent technique, right? Because you, if you don't have the intent to change, if you don't have the intent to grow, it doesn't matter what techniques you're doing. I mean, the techniques will cause change, but they often cause a lot of chaos because it's like hitting the brakes and the gas pedal at the same time, you know, and I'm doing all these things that's creating change, but I don't really want to change, or I don't know where I'm going. So it's like driving with your feet, with your hands off the steering wheel, you know, and you're going through the gears. Where do you want to go? That's so important because when you make that determination, then you go. You know, all this energy lines up and takes you there. You know, particularly if where you're going is in harmony with your truth. Because that's really what this is all about. So maybe even if your like, intent is taking you somewhere that's not in harmony with your truth, it's going to take you far enough that all of a sudden you go, oh, this is where I need to be. And you adjust course. 
but it's where do I want to go? And there's no ceiling on this. It's amazing to me where people put their ceilings. Because full yogic states of awareness are available to all of us. It's not just people who are born wearing loincloths and you know walking around the jungle or whatever. Everybody has the opportunity. Everybody is born with that capacity. So where do you want to go? And then beyond yogic states, you know, to explore creation. It's all available to all of us. Like I said, that wagon wheel. You know, the part that's touching the ground is what most of us are, that's all that most of us are aware of. And then people are getting to know more and more of it. So how much of that wagon wheel do you want to know? How much of your being do you want to know? How much power are you willing to accept? You know, how much immensity and capacity are you willing to be? Because that's really the only limitation, is what your intent is. What is your intent? Where do you want to go? And I was young enough and naive enough to like set some really high goals thinking I would never reach them. And I reached them much sooner than... <laughs> I didn't think I would ever reach them, so anything sooner would have been <laughs> sooner than I thought. But I was like, you know, and you know you're onto something when like your experience doesn't match anything you expect, right? Then it's like, okay, this is definitely beyond the mind because my mind couldn't have conceived this. So, um, so this is like, these are tools to take you where you want to go, <clears throat> okay? And the only thing, there's no right or wrong, and it's just where do you want to go, you know? And that's just your decision. And it's just, do I want to live a happy, harmonious life here? Cool, you can do that. You can absolutely do that. Do I want to have these experiences of awareness and dissolve the world and, you know, experience cosmic unity? You can do that. You know, do you want to go beyond that and like take your place in the hierarchy of creation? And, you know, you can do that. So it's all here. And it's just where do you want to go? So I encourage you to set high goals, high desires, and then exceed them, you know. And it's amazing how much a little bit of fuel will take you when you know where you want to go. Because we're all expending energy every day, right? So like what if you, you know, I told my friend, she was like spinning her life around in circles and she burnt a lot of energy. And then she started practicing and it like all lined up. I'm like, isn't it amazing when you're not spending any more energy going in a straight line, you're just going somewhere, you know? But we get caught up in our patterns and we live our patterns and these patterns control us, you know? And we don't even realize that these patterns because we all think it's fresh. But I say, like, I can catch up with somebody that I haven't seen in a decade. I can catch up with them in 20, 30 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, because I just go find out, okay, now Bob has been replaced by Sue, and Sue has been replaced by Joe. It's the same pattern. So they're complaining about this going on in their life. It's just a different person or it's a different job or whatever, but they're still living the same patterns. And until you start breaking out and going somewhere, that's your life is a pattern, you know. And I mean, I'm speaking from experience. Yes, ma'am. Are you saying with the intention that we should, when we practice, we should set an intention? I mean, in your life, you need to set an intention. Okay. Okay, like... Not necessarily when we practice. Not necessarily, no. I mean... Can we use it in that way? Use. Use the meditation practice in that way, set an intention, and um, <coughs> sort of potentize the intention with our cobra breath practice. Absolutely. I mean, you can use that to, you know, to, to, I mean, yes, absolutely to like, and that's almost like, a, it's not almost, that's a form of magic, but it's, you know, using it to, to energize and activate that. The bigger thing is to have that, the larger picture intention. And if that's in harmony with who you are, by definition, it's in harmony with creation. Okay? Like your personal Tao is in harmony with the all Tao, right? So if you have an intention for your life, and then sub-intentions like that embed in that, right? So any meditation, everything you do, every waking moment, every sleeping moment, should be in harmony with and directed toward that larger intention. And then smaller things like that can be steps along the path or whatever are embedded within that. So absolutely. So in this case, I'm talking like every meditation should take you further on the path towards your goal. You know, every time you go to work or speak to your child or make a meal, it should be within the context of this is my life, this is my goal, this is where I'm going.
So uh, there's three princ yogic principles, you know, or three principles, yama, niyama, and thalima, which uh, there's a little section in your packet on it. But thalima we talked about is your true self. It's your true will. Who you're supposed to be in this, or who you are in this life. Okay? Yama, loosely translated as control, but the way we use it here, or the way it's used is, Get rid of the things that interfere with your path. Okay? Niyama would be bringing the things that support you. Okay? So this is a way of organizing your existence. This is who I am. This is my goal. This is my intent. This is my will. My thelema. Right? What supports, what doesn't support that needs to go. What interferes with that, what, what distracts from that needs to go. What helps that needs to come in. And there's no right or wrong answers. That's the problem with like yoga has a, has a yama and they're like, eat this and don't eat that and blah, blah, blah. That might work for that yogi. And that's what happened when we were talking about religion, right? This spiritual master, that spiritual master achieved this experience and comes back and says, hey, I didn't drink alcohol and I didn't do this, but I did do this and I did do this. So then the followers turn those into laws, and if you drink alcohol or do this, then they kill you. And if you don't do this and don't do that, they kill you, right? And so it's turning that person's yama into like a law for everybody. And that takes away the individuality of who you are and what you are. So the best I can do is once again say, this is what worked for me. You know, I climbed Mount Everest, and it's good for me to bring a lot of beef and champagne you know, or whatever. But that doesn't mean you had to bring, have to bring beef and champagne, but you might go, you know. And so it's listening to these people is advice, but like, what's his name? Richard Francis Burton. You know, he said, he noblest lives and noblest dies who makes and keeps his self-made laws. You know, and this is about personal empowerment, but that's also about personal responsibility. And what most people in this world don't want is that so much easier to go, hey, preacher man, what's right and wrong? Hey, teacher lady, what's right or wrong? Tell me how I should act. Tell me what I should do. And you don't have to think for yourself. You don't have to decide for yourself. You don't have to be responsible for yourself. This is what we would call the right-hand path, different, than, different analogy than the Vama Marg. This is the right-hand path, which is the path of individual responsibility. You know, I am an individual responsible for myself and creation. I'm the equal of all the beings out there because they don't want to meet you as a subordinate. They want to meet you as an equal. Now, it doesn't, they, they have things to teach you, but they don't need your worship. Why would they need your worship? I already live up here. Why do I need your energy for? Right? I mean, think about it. And we worship. And some beings let you worship them just like, but that's for spiritual kindergarten. Right? I need something to focus on externally. But at some point, you, you become your own being. And then they want to meet you and teach you, you know. And it doesn't mean that they have things to teach you. That doesn't mean they see themselves as superior to you. And for me, that's like my analogy is Albert Einstein, right? There's a one point in Albert Einstein's life that he didn't know how to add and subtract, right? He was a child. Doesn't mean he wasn't a genius. Didn't mean he didn't have all that potential. But if you treat him like an idiot because he didn't know how to... That's, that's, that's not reflective of reality. You know, so a teacher like develops that, but sees him as equal to raise him up. So it's not a matter of, you know, I'm, I'm less than them and therefore I need to worship, I need to beg them for whatever. They will meet you as an individual, as a, you know, and as an equal and share and teach. But it takes a pretty strong set of ovaries to meet a divine being as your equal, right? And so that's part of what this is, is developing that self-esteem, developing that self-worth, so that when the opportunity comes, it's like, what wisdom do you have for me? You know, let's learn. Let me take my place in creation, you know? And so you're studying for your PhD. It's not like all the professors are superior beings to you. They just have more information to share with you until you get to their level, you know? But if you look at yourself as inferior, you're never going to get there, right? So that's what this is about. Is like developing that wagon wheel, you know, and activating that wagon wheel. So, 
It's a spiritual science. So will, yama, and niyama. You decide who you are and what you want, right? I want to be a sculptor. I want to be a sculptor, all right? Well, let me see. I've got this $3 million house, and I have to work 80 hours a week to afford my mortgage. Well, part of my yama is to get rid of the $3 million house and to rent the place for 500 bucks a week or a month so that I can put my money and time and effort into learning to be a sculptor, right? So it's not even what you think. And what Gene needs to get rid of is different than what Paul needs to get rid of. And what Gene needs to have support his path is different than what Paul needs to have to support his path. But they both need to have a yama and niyama to get them down the road. You know, and my, my sound current teacher would talk about peripheral and pertinent, you know, and, and anything that's pertinent, you know, it's like his analogy is driving down the road in his motorcycle. Anything that can interfere with the path of that motorcycle is pertinent information. Everything else is peripheral, right? And so what is pertinent to your path? What is pertinent to helping that motorcycle down the road or, or, or that would interfere with it? You know, if I need it, you know, if I'm an Olympic sprinter, right? If I, my goal is to, to be in the Olympics. I mean, you've got the freedom to do, to do and be anything you want to be. But here's the self-responsibility, right? It's not that I can do anything I want. It's to do what I will, right? And that's, that's the ultimate freedom and the ultimate responsibility. I want to be an Olympic sprinter, all right? Well, guess what? I can't hang out and drink shots of tequila with my college friends all night, you know? I need to get up at, you know, 6 in the morning and eat this specific food and then do this stretching and then do this exercise and then, you know, eat this other food. So it's, a, it's ultimate freedom, but it's also the ultimate responsibility and discipline. Well, it's the ultimate freedom and the ultimate discipline. And it's your responsibility because you got nobody else to blame it to. And you know, the world of religion today, the world of authorities, you know, like I said, we go back to the, to the Ten Commandments. Like, how immature does a culture have to be that they have to have an edict saying, thou shalt not kill? You know, where's the personal responsibility in that? So that's what this is about is creating your life path, you know, consciously toward what you want to do and then allowing it to be flexible because once again it's that's a societal structure now you're going to be in this career until you retire at 65 or whatever no I'm do this until I'm no longer receiving fulfillment and growth and then I change and that's the flexibility all right and here I'm teaching you techniques on the way to being technique-less right but you have to learn techniques first and my analogy with this is straight back out of the military. You know, when I was in there, my goal was ultimately at the time was to be in the Special Forces. So to be in the Special Forces, which is unconventional warfare, you have to be, if you're enlisted, you have to be a sergeant, at least, or you have to be a captain if you're an officer, right? So you have to have, like, about five years of experience in a conventional military before they'll teach you how to be unconventional. Because how can you go against the convention if you don't know what the convention is. So it's just like that, or it's very similar to that. I want to teach you techniques, which is conventional. Do this practice, do this practice, do this practice. But the purpose of that is to generate your awareness of this, right? And once you have awareness of this, then you can mix those practices as, see, as you see fit to move the energy through there to reach your goal of the moment which will be in harmony with your overall intent, right? So we're teaching you these techniques, but like the guy I was talking about in Vienna, I don't want you to be like rigid in these techniques. I do this technique, therefore I'm enlightened. No, the technique is a means to an end. And the awareness that comes with the technique then gives you freedom. Because really, once this is open, you can, I can close my eyes and move energy in there that I want, wherever I want, you know? And another analogy I have is like martial arts. And they teach you a form, or they teach you forms. And you do these forms, and this form is going to teach me this block. And then it's going to teach me this block, and then this strike and this kick, right? Except if you get in a fight and you start doing a form, you can get your butt kicked, right? So you got to take, you got to break out of that rigidity and flow. All right, now I need to use this block, now I need to use this kick, now I need to run away, or whatever. So that's what we're going for here, you know, is I'm teaching you techniques. 
And you have to practice the techniques because a lot of people, not a lot of people, some people get arrogant and go, oh, I feel that already. No. You got to do the practices and you got to get a result. But then from there, you're able to mix and match the techniques. And even now, I want you to take what we're, you're learning here and mix and match them as suits you at that time. But to do it in a, you know, but to do the techniques until you get grounded in the experience that comes with it. And then, then you can flow with it. And I say, there may be people in this room, there probably are people in this room that know more techniques than me. Because it's not about the number of techniques, you know. It's about your intent, and it's about your, your relaxation, but it's mostly about your experience, right? One technique, practice intently with, tech, with experience, I mean with, with intention, will give you an experience. That experience is the goal. And once again, it's not like, I dress this way because I read it in a book, or I speak this way because somebody told me that that's positive. It's like you do that because it's, it's like internal, an external expression of who you are as your physiology changes. I, I treat people with love because I feel love. I speak in a loving way because that's what vibrates for me. I kick that person's ass because that's the love that they need at this moment, yeah. you know? Um, so it doesn't look a particular way. So the spiritual science of it, you know, is hypothesis, experiment, observation, conclusion. But we're looking at a goal, which is our intent, you know? And, it's, and, and then, will and yama niyama, who am I? And so even if you don't know who you are, that's the first, that's the first step, right? I don't know if I want to be a sculptor or a lawyer or an Indian chief, right? So that's the first step. I got to create a life where I have the time and the space to explore and heal until I figure out who I am. And then the next step is to create a life that takes me to that. And then the next step to take me beyond that, right? So even people who don't know their will, their thelema, that's still, this whole thing applies. All right, I need to know who I am. Well, if I'm working 80 hours a week and partying and I'm on the bowling team and the volleyball team and all this, I don't have time to meditate. So I got to get rid of some of those things. And I got to shift my life, you know, so that I have time to meditate or contemplate or read or whatever it is that supports the finding of me. Because in the end, there's nothing else worthy of it, right? Castaneda, well, Don Juan, right, said, to seek the perfection of the warrior spirit is the only task worthy of our manhood womanhood also, right? But that's it, like, what else? When you get to the end, it's like, well, I was really good on the bowling team, you know? Is that who you were meant to be, you know? And so if you're not living your truth, to me, every moment you're not living your truth is you're squandering the life, right? And so you're either looking for that truth or living it, you know? And that's what it's all about to me. And we, in the culture, generally do it backwards. You know, people are born, and they go to school, and they get out of school, and they get a job, and they get married, and they have children, and then they retire. And at some point along that line, usually near the end, they're like, well, what was life about anyway? You know, but it should happen as soon as possible. What is life about? Why am I here? And then you figure that out, and then you can live a life. Until then, you're living a program. And that's what Sunyata talked about, you know, is the first part of this practice it like erases the grooves of the record, what most people would think of as the ego, but it's the programming, right? It's from the moment you were born or even before you were born in the womb, but even before that, because stuff comes back from other lifetimes. But you're programmed from the moment you're born with your parents' idea of who you should be, your babysitter's idea, your preacher, your teacher, your friends, your peers, your coworkers, the commercials, the billboards, everything, the movies you watch, it's all got a program of what it means to be cool and what it means to be successful and what it means to be, you know, whatever. And then we're living this program. Okay? And that's who we are. That's what the ego is, is our conception of ourselves, which is generally based in the mind. Right? So the first thing that happens is we start to erase that. And then what happens? I don't know who I am. Which is a beautiful place to be. Yeah. Now that scares the shit out of a lot of people because what is number one fear, even beyond going to school naked or, or being in a public speaking, you know, is like the fear of the unknown, right? So I don't know who I am. Is, 
in the big picture and from my place when somebody says that to me I'm like congratulations but their place is like I don't know who I am because they don't know where you know and so I try you know I try to encourage people with the idea of doesn't matter you know there, there's nothing to fear here because the only thing that's going to go away is that which is not you and the only thing that's going to come in is that which is you you know the only pain that happens is the resistance of either of those and I know from experience, I mean, I'm not saying like, ooh, this was all roses and sunshine for me. I mean, I'm a pretty strong-willed person. So it took a, a pretty strong effort to squash my idea of who I thought I was and what I thought spirituality was. I mean, it was painful, you know. But what I experienced was much more beautiful. Like I said, it was beyond what my mind could have conceived. And... The, the, like, the ironic realization at the end was all the pain that I went through, I caused myself by holding on to my images. You know, because I thought, you know, I'm going to be spiritual. I'm going to have this, you know, because, you know, the whole game. And this house and this helicopter and this car and this picture yeah. and all this crap, right? That's the program. And then, like, I was holding on to that program. And being a strong person, I was able to hold on to it stronger than most people. And they had to, because my intention was I want to know. I want to understand. I want to know why we're here. I want to know what this is all about, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, okay. And when they say, I say they, I mean the higher parts of my being. But it was like, you got to get rid of all that. Because the other thing I said was, I want it fast, you know? <laughs> and they squished me like, and I thought I was free, white, and 21, right? I was like 10 feet tall and bulletproof. I was, you know, I was a white man in a white man's society. I mean, it was like, no, dude, you are nothing. <laughs> and then it was like, wow. Cause, and there's a song by Collective Soul that, you know, basically is like, a, I laughed at myself as the tears rolled down because it's the world. And it's true. You know, it was like looking out from that precipice at my history. And all that pain I created because I was holding on to something that wasn't real. And that I had asked for reality. And they're like, all you got to do is let go, dude. And when I finally did, it was just that. It's not like you have to grab anything. You just let go. You know, let go of who you think you are. Let go of what you think is spiritual. Let go of, you know, these constraints. And I watch people in my classes and people that I get to know. And they're like living the image and regurgitating stuff from all these spiritual books, but like not living it, you know. And like you can, rep you can repeat it, but it's all abstract. It's all mental until you do it. So the world dissolves. Who you think you are dissolves. But that's what you're asking for. Because it's not who you are. It's who you think you are. It's not real. You know, our mind makes us feel it's real. But it's not. And the matrix dissolves. So, you know, my analogy is you can't leave on the boat while you're holding on to the dock. And if you try, it's, you're going to get stretched, and it's going to hurt. Or and, fall in the water. Right, yeah, that would have been nice if I'd been smart enough to just let go and fall in the water. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, one of my teachers would say, like, the bird can't fly if it's holding on to the branch. <laughs> you know, so it's that. It's like the first thing that's going to happen is these, these grooves are going to erase. And you're going to go, who am I? Why am I here? Is, what is real? The society, all of a sudden, it's not real. All this stuff that we're fighting over and arguing over, none of that's real. This religion is not real. This, you know, all the things that my parents taught me is not real. And that's disconcerting. You know, it can be disconcerting. That's kind of, you know, the, the beauty of the opportunity for us to support each other. You know, it's because, like, we're all going, it's all going to be different for us because, like I said, what people, each of you have to let go of, what each of you have to heal, is different. What each of you need to support you is different, but we're all going to go through a process of letting go and healing and bringing in, you know, and so there can be the support. Like, my life is just falling freaking apart. Oh, yeah, mine too. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's that, but that's a good thing that your life has fallen apart because what happened was they took the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and mashed them into the wrong places. <laughs> and, you know, if you pull them out, you can put them back in to the right places and get rid of the ones that don't belong. So, in the end, you know, and take this with you. In the end, there's nothing to fear. Because all that's going to go away is that which is not you. And all that's going to come in is that which is you. 
And the only pain involved is the resistance. And generally the resistance is because it doesn't meet our picture. But the picture is far more beautiful than we can imagine. You know, it's like we talked earlier about it's beyond the mind. They should have sent a poet. Well, they did. The poet wrote it in poetry and then we interpreted it wrong. You know, or that's what we do. That's how it is. And it's not like anybody's fault. That's just trying to interpret with the mind that which is beyond the mind. So, like, even in this class, it's a dance, because I'm talking to your mind to give you a concept of why we're doing this, and hopefully have something for you to reflect back on as the processes take place. You know, but it's going to be a process that's beyond your mind, right? And it's funny, because, like, that is one of the ironies, is, like, I read these books, and they make no sense. And then I had these experiences, and I read those books, and they all made sense. <laughs> But it's like, they were trying to prepare me, but they made no sense. And it's like, that's, that's part of the irony of it, is like, it doesn't make sense until after you've had the experiences and integrated them, you know? And then, uh, oh, that's what this brilliant mind was trying to say, you know? So, so that's, that's what this is about. The techniques are about experience, you know? It's not, I mean, how many people are just like technique junkies? And they run from seminar to seminar and learn technique after technique after technique and never practice or practice a little. But it's mostly, oh, yes, darling, I just learned Qigong from so-and-so. <laughs> I say, wow, that's cool, but you haven't changed in 10 years. <laughs> you know? Or I just learned one thing and practice it with intent. And you don't even have to learn one thing. You just have to like, have the intent because life will bring you what you need if you have the intent. You know? But it put y'all here for some reason. <laughs> so that's what this is about. Is a, and that's what will, yama, and niyama, how it all fits together.